So, rap or go to the league? Yeah. They say those are the only two ways out. You did both. Let's talk about your journey and how you got to where you are today. Well, you know, for me, as far as the, the ball part, you know, I grew up in the Calio Projects, probably one of the most dangerous places at the time for a kid to survive. And when everybody was partying, I was in the middle of that coat weight shooting jumpers, like putting them up. Like I, it was time, by the time nighttime hit, we had no lights. It was dark in the project. I kept shooting. They say, well, coaches was coming from John Thompson to Dale Brown, coming to see me. They say, how, do, how you shoot so good? Because I shoot in the dark. If I could shoot when, with the lights off, I know what's going to happen when the lights come on. And uh, sometimes people don't realize you, if you want something out of life, you got to put the work in. I tell people all the time, everybody got 24 hours. It's what you do with yours. And then on the music side, man, there was nobody big in the South. At the time, you had rap a lot, which came before me, and uh, Uncle Luke came before me. But I, I felt like, you know, the New Orleans bounce sound was going to change the game because people wanted to party. Uh, so I added the, the street music with the bounce, and it just made a unique sound. And um, you know, put your trust in God and hard work. You know, a lot of people, they give up before they really get to where they're going at. And I'm just one of them guys, man, there's going to be no limit. There's going to be no limit. That's all I kept saying. I never said I was poor when I lived in the ghetto. I always say I'm waiting on my money, you know, <laughs> to check in the mail. Like, I'm not going to use people. I'm going the power of words. Power of words, when you say, you know, I'm broke, I'm done. That's normally what it is, you know. Uh, when I got into the music business, I said I'm a master of what I do, so I called myself Master P because, you know, my first name, Percy, and just used the initial with master. And, um, and, and I always thought like an entrepreneur. Even as a kid, five, six years old, I was carrying the older people groceries from the store. I was cutting grass. So I was doing stuff that bosses do, but I was at a young age, I'm like, then, then nobody in my family had anything. So I lived with my grandparents, while most kids complain. My grandparents had 12 kids, and uh, that's what motivated me. I know I needed to make millions. Like, thousands, not gonna do it for me. You know, one million, not gonna do it for me. I was raised with 14 kids in the house with two adults, that was 16 people in a three bedroom project. So I never had a bed till I went to college. I slept on the floor, but I was happy. I had a roof over my head. So I tell people all the time, don't let your conditions stop you. you how, how did your conditions motivate you? That motivated me, man. I was the last one to eat in the house. Think about it. You got 12 other kids before you. You know, most of the time I got the short end of the stick, but I use that as I can't do nothing but go up from here. You know, I start thinking about the things I have. I got a roof over my head. I don't live in a mansion, but I have a roof over my head. I got to be thankful for what I have. So, and then I put my trust in God, man. Uh, put my trust and faith in God. I said, you know what? It got to be something better for me. So, you know, in that hard work, saying I don't, nobody don't have to give me nothing, I'm going to work for it. So, so for people that, that look like us, yeah. um, you know, a lot of us come from situations where our peers, even our yeah. families, yeah. Um, they're a product of their environment in the yeah. wrong way, right? They end yeah. up in jail, they end up dead, yeah. they end up wrong, hanging out. And same thing for you, right? Yeah. Some of the ple people closest to you. Um, I had a lot of family members uh, incarcerated. Uh, a lot of them had problems. You know, uh, people don't realize this mental illness thing is, is real. Um, also, drugs. So I said I was going to break that negative cycle. I kept saying, you know, when people was looking at me like, man, let's go turn up. I'm like, I ain't got time to turn up. That, like, this ain't right. I want, I want a better life. I want a better life for my kids. Yeah. And, um, you know, mostly, and that's what I put in my movies. So when you look at a movie like I got to hook up to, you're going to find a lot of that stuff in that little Jews that, that deal with real life subjects. Yeah. And uh, like the gentrification, ownership. I realized that nobody in my family owned that. So people say, well, why are you always thought about 
ownership because nobody in my family ever owned me. You know, I mean, I couldn't even get a, a car for the prom. We, it, like, we just didn't have the money, and then we had no credit. So I got the $200 to go rent the car, but then, you know, nobody had a credit card. So you get to Hertz or Budget or one of those, and they say, well, you know, you might have the money with a credit card in. So, you know, people don't realize when learning economics, you know, even in high school, I tell people all the time, I said, economics is what changed my life and saved me financial literacy, knowing that, that the banking system, all these different things, you know, a lot of pro athletes, they don't understand that because they work, 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 and they run by me playing sports. I think that's what saved my life because it taught me the team atmosphere, but by me being a great student, it helped me get over the hump and going to college, understanding business communication and stuff like that. And being from the streets, it gave me another edge because I, I could understand what the hustle is, you know. So you need all those to be a boss, you know, especially in this millennial time, because if you don't know one or the other, you're going to lose, you know. So you, you could be book smart, but not street smart, and you're still going to lose. You know, or you could be street smart and not book smart, and you're gonna end up incarcerated or, or dead. Right. You know, because you gotta outthink what your environment is. And so that was the greatest thing for me to experience how to outthink my environment. Because as an African American male, when you grow up in poverty, you gotta survive getting from the house to school. Uh, the house to work, or the house to the gym. And uh, you should, your goal should be wanting to make it out of there. And that's, that's, that's what drove me, like, I gotta get out of here. And I know I have to have a great team. It's like what I have now in business, it ain't just me, it's having a great team. And you have more than one vertical under you. It's not just music, it's not no. just film, it's, it's is that clothing, man, clothing right? shoes, let me show you something, man. Yeah, let me see those. This is the Mayatis. We wow. call these the Bugatti of shoes. This is Italian leather. Yeah. And uh, handmade in Italy. And, and, and you know what's, what's really inspiring to me as a, yeah. a, a young, I'm yeah. a design, as yeah. a young African-American entrepreneur myself, is yeah. to, to see that you saw something, you had a vision for something, and you yeah. went out and did it. Yeah. You know, you didn't just go and, you know, sit in the house of Adidas nah. and sit in the nah. house of Nike. And I mean, they could do it while we can't do it. Right. With me, I'm looking at professional athletes, but even us, being able to wear this product, believe in it, get it out there. I mean, we sell thousands of these a month, which is unheard of, which a brand growing this fast because of the power of technology and where we are now with social media, uh, the star power, being able to utilize your social media as a business. Most people use it the wrong way as, oh, you know, you just clowning or having fun or going out to the club. You know, social media is a business too. A lot of people have made a lot of money. If you look at the Kardashians, these people are making money off of social media. And we have to understand that if we're gonna empower the next generation or build a generational wealth, then we have to realize how to use social media and the internet for as a, a technology business tool. Right, creating a lane of your own, right? Mm -hmm. um, not only did your environment help get you to where you are, yeah. um, your, your conditions at home, but a bit of curiosity too, right? Yeah. I think, let's, let's talk a bit about you finding Michael Jackson's lawyer. Yeah. That, like that is mind blowing because you, you, yeah. your curiosity yeah. changed well, your life really. Well, that's where education come in there. So for me to research that Michael Jackson is the highest paid entertainer in the world, I'm like, well, who is doing his business? The average guy that get in the music business, is, they're not going to think like that. Well, let's, let's walk us through it, though. Let's talk so, about how you found him. So I went to the library, and you know, I pulled up Michael Jackson, and I said, who is Michael Jackson's attorney? And that's what I wanted to know. And when I found out, you know, I flew to Hollywood, and uh, I sit down with him. He said, man, I ain't, we busy. If you want to sit down with me, it's going to be 25K. I said, 25K? I said, all right, I figured it out. I came back, gave him the 25K, and I sat down with him. I said, uh, 
what type of deal Michael Jackson had. He said he got a, he got a record deal. It's 22%. He's the highest paid entertainer in the world. So I said, this guy making 22 cent, I mean 22% a record, and he's the highest paid entertainer in the world. Is it a deal bigger than that? He said, the only deal you could get is a distribution deal where you get 85 cent, 85% and a record company get 15%. He said, but the only way you're going to get that deal, you're going to need between two hundred to $300,000. I said, man, I just gave you $25,000. Tell me I need two hundred to 300000 I left. Probably was the best twenty-five dollars I ever spent because every record company came after me. All I know, I wanted a distribution deal, which is an 85-15 deal. So when people told me no, I said, okay, cool. And I kept saying no, kept saying no until... You know, I was offered millions of dollars, and uh, one company, Priority Records, they they end up offering me the deal. Say, if I have two hundred grand, they'll give me that distribution deal, which is probably a deal that's unprecedented. Where I made Forbes, I made more than the record company. I made the top ten, forty under Forbes, and uh, I made more than the company that put my music out. Wow. <laughs> Right, so let's talk about, well, your, your No Limit retail store parlayed that business for you, yes, right? It carried yeah. you over. Yeah, so people don't know I learned the business from retail. So No Limit Records was a retail store first. I'm a 19-year-old kid with a business in which, you know, several stores came through there from 2 Pi to E-40 to 2 Shot. I could name it on and on. It was in the bank in Richmond, California. I, I, I created this record store. And... Uh, I specialize in hip hop, specialize in getting music to you the next day. That's when FedEx and UPS first came out. So none of the older companies was on it. So they had another mom and pop store up the street, but they focused on gospel and R&B. And they didn't know nothing about FedEx and UPS. So I got any record, any CD overnight. It's no limit to whatever I could get when it comes to the music business. And uh, it turned my business from no money to 10000 a month to probably 10000 a day. Wow. As a 19-year-old kid. So, wow. And that, that's how I got into the music business. Uh, uh, from there, you know, because I had a story. It was like, you know, I come from poverty. And I'm like, you know, a lot of these songs that I was selling, you know, it was all dark. So, you know, that's when I came up with the ice cream man. So I was like, I'm going to light it up. Uh, I think I had a diamond Rolex watch. I, I called the guy that, that do the, uh, the covers in Texas, pen and pixel. I said, can you make my logo like my watch? And that's where the whole bling thing came from to where <laughs> they made my logo, the No Limit logo, like my uh, Rolex watch with the that's diamond. That's revolutionary, the, the, yeah. the introduction of jewelry in the music industry. Yeah. Like, the real introduction. Oh no, the whole ice cream man. Like, let me see, see this is, show y'all this man. I don't normally wear jewelry that much, but I. But today you I pulled gotta, it out though. I gotta, pull, <laughs> I gotta pull out the ice cream man. <laughs> oh, so y'all, right <laughs> so y'all can see that, you know. Yeah. That's the, that's the original. Wow. Ice cream man. You know everybody else. When you talk about talk about jewelry, you gotta get this right, man. You can't be, you know. That that right there, you know, it's that's if 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 hip hop had a museum that yeah. belongs in it. Oh yeah, you this know, the this the does, official. They need to inquire about this that. This the official ice cream man. So you know, to be able to own your own business, this is where it all started from, right here, yeah. the ice cream man. So this piece of jewelry right here, this is. This is history. Yeah, I agree. You know, this ice cream corn, like it changed everything because everything was dark. Everything was dark back in the days in the W.A., the ghetto boys, everybody wore black. You know, Easy e Ice Cube, they all wore the black dicky suits. And I'm like, I got to change this. Yeah. I did the white dicky suits, the ice cream truck, put the Lexus on triple gold Dayton. You know, that's where the whole blank thing to where people start like, man, you know, and people don't realize it's in my store, so I tested it in the store. When I put those diamonds on the back of the cup in the store, people instantly walk in the store, give me that right there. That's when I knew, like, you know what? That was it. 
This, this is what marketing is about. So people start calling me a marketing genius because of the product. I start changing the colors on the CDs. And so every CD had a different color. Gotcha. So I ended up went from selling no records, opening up for Tupac, and having one fan and turning it into millions and just, you know, selling hundred millions of CDs. That, let's fast forward to your your business acumen becoming a lot more polished, right? Yeah. There was a situation where um, yourself, Baby, yeah. Nelly, and yeah. Puff yeah. were dropping the album on the same day because yeah. of, it was Universal, correct? Universal, yeah. And you put two and two together, call each of those guys, like, how much are you spending on your marketing? Yeah, two million. I, I called everybody because the record uh, marketing person they spent two million on my album, supposed to have been two million on Puff, two million on Babe, and two million on Nelly. And I'm like, if one guy flying all around, like why are we all paying two million? So when I went to Doug Morris, he was like, you know, man, you, you know, you need to just chill out. And I even called them, I called everybody up, I said, man, this ain't good business. One man flying to all those places, why are we all paying two million for the marketing? So they ended up giving me 10 million to leave that deal. And I just did my own thing. I'm like, all right, well. Who, you know, what was the response of your colleagues when you let them know? They, they, was, they didn't really want it, you know. I don't think they really want because they probably had so much business. I probably had the least That's amount true. of business with it. So I understand why they did what they did. But for me, it didn't make sense. You know, so, you know, I tell people all the time, you have to know your business. Like, for me, you know, Doing a deal, I tell people, never do a deal when you're desperate. <laughs> you know? And uh, if we're going to make money, we have to build a relationship. We got to do it the right way where we all eat. Right. So, you know, I, I, I can't work in a deal where it, it's not right. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about how uh, associated risk, like yeah. you risking yeah. things, has evolved to what you are today. Yeah, so people don't know, like, in the music business, I always put my own money up. All the movies I made, I always put my own money up. And it's a, it's a risk. Like, on this movie, I got to hook up, too. Me and Romeo, you know, we the first father and son to really, from hip-hop, put our own money up for a film. And, uh, I mean, we haven't got paid yet. We're going to get paid that in the end. But everybody else is paid. So that's what comes with being a boss and being an entrepreneur, you know, taking that risk, knowing that, what if your money don't come back? You know, well, I ask everybody, so from John Weatherspoon to, to everybody in this project, I made sure, and that, I think that's what people don't realize it comes with being a boss. You wait for your money in the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it come back big, you win. I don't live for that deal. If that deal gonna kill you or stop you from being successful, then don't do it. Like, it's not going to stop me. So I, 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 I'm, I'm just appreciative to be a part of this with my son because my whole thing was building a generational wealth. And this is where it started, you know, with me and Romeo and then passing this down to the other kids and to build that generational wealth. And um, I tell people all the time, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. You know, it's how you do it. And... Um, you do it the right way, it's gonna come back. I feel like this movie is gonna change the game. Putting social media stars with Hollywood stars, it's gonna change the way Hollywood make movies. It's gonna change the game because right now, to market a movie, you need social media. Let's be honest, I don't care how big your movie is, you need social media. With this project right here, I have 126 speaking roles with actors and actresses. We up for the Guinness Book of Records, it's never been done. And the crazy thing about this, on the social media side of this, I have over 200 million followers together with all the talent in this project. Hollywood never had a film like this. You know, never. They might have one or two people with five or 10 million or something in a project, but 200 million? And these, these are the kind of films that, that build careers, not only on the oh, acting yeah. side, but on the music side. You've got soundtracks. Soundtracks. You've got the actors that finally get a stage and a platform. Let me tell you something. So Jeezy in the film with me, we have the first single. It's called Gone. 
And, um, you know, it's going to be a cold summer. I tell people it's going to be a, the ice cream man, the snow man together. It's going to be a cold summer to be able to, to make these type of boss moves, you know, for the soundtrack. Um, it, it's just an incredible cast, like I said, to take, like, a Fat Boy, a DC Young Fly, a P.O., a Michael Blackston, uh, a Juju, a Erica Mina, a uh, Romeo, my daughter Symphony, you know, me, AJ, Gary Johnson, John Weatherspoon. Uh, man, it, this is going to be a funny movie. Like, people are going to be turned into stars instantly because everybody brought their A game. So, you know, I feel like this is, this is the next generation of filmmaking. Do you, do you do anything that, because I hear your passion spilling mm. out of everything, every yeah. point, every person you name. Yeah. Do you do anything that, would you step into any type of business where there's no passion? Nah, about? if I don't have passion for it, if it don't go into what I'm doing, because you have to know your business. I tell people, if you don't know your business, if you're not passionate about what you do, that means you don't love it. You know, I got two kids that play basketball. I got a seventh grader and a tenth grader. And I tell them, I say, if you want to be successful, you have to love what you do. You got to know everything about it. You got to know the history. You got to know you have to outwork your opponent. So if you're not willing to do that, you know, I tell Mercy and Hershey all the time, man, you might as well do something else. Do something that you love. Because you're not going to beat me at what I do because I love it. No matter what it is. Like, they're not going to beat me at making urban movies. They, they're not going to do it. This is what I know how to do. I'm passionate about it. I love it. I put my time into it. Uh, I'm making quality projects, and I'm able to give back. So that's the difference, too. So that's where my passion comes from. It's not about just making the money. We can't take this with us. I always feel like the more I make, the more I can give. So I've been having a foundation for over 19 years, and I, I help inner city youth for education. And I hope the elderly. And Funny so, thing is, I sorry to cut you off. I have a story about you giving. Okay. Um, I played AAU basketball. Yeah. And my team was stranded in Vegas. Yeah. And I'm sleeping. Somebody taps me and says, "Master P bought our flights home." Yeah. So you didn't even know you did that for me until we sat here today. Yeah. Well, you know, my my thing is in a situation like that, you know, the t when I played AAU, we couldn't even afford to fly. We always got in a little raggedy van and we drove around and I know how hard it is, even for the coaches. You know, some people love these kids that much where they might get in over the head. And uh, it, I feel like at the time, if I meet a coach and he's sincere and he's trying to get his kids back, if I could help, I just thank God that I was in that position to where I could do that. But you, not only did you, in that moment, help a lot of kids and a coach, yeah. but you also fast forward 10 years from now, when we're all men, yeah. we all want to do that for somebody else. Yes. So you paid it forward. Oh, yeah. Know, no. now I, I didn't just look at you as Master Peter artist. I yeah. looked at you as Master Peter understands economics, Master yeah. Peter entrepreneur. And I, it also made me want to dig into some of your business skills yeah. and just learn from you. So my thing is with that, and that's what it should be about. Like, why don't we celebrate success and positive things? We celebrate negative stuff all day. The media celebrated. But what about doing something positive? Us as a culture and people doing something positive to make the next kid want to do something positive. I tell my kids in my program, right now a lot of kids come through my program from DeMar DeRozan to Brandon Jennings you know, come through that basketball program that, that I had and I still have, which my kids are playing, and it's all inner city kids. I tell all those kids in there, if one of y'all make it, y'all don't owe me nothing. Y'all just come back and help the next generation. I feel like that's the way we keep this going. In, in closing, I'd like to ask you, what, yeah. what advice would you give the, the next emerging Master P, who's in New Orleans, yeah. sleeping on the floor. Yeah. What advice do you have for that person? Don't give up. Like, don't let your conditions or your environment stop you from getting to your dreams and your goals. There's no limit to what you can do. You put your trust 
and faith in God. And if they close the door, you go through the window. You know, your destination is determined by the choices that you make. Don't be afraid to change if you want to be successful. Don't be afraid to cut negative friends off. Don't be afraid to cut negative family members off to get to where you need to go. To be honest, like, you got to do what it's going to take for you to be successful. And you won't have to put the work in. It's not going to be easy. Especially if you don't have nothing, don't look for nobody to give you nothing. Go out there and get it. Because most people, they think that, you know, some people always say, man, I just need a hand up or whatever. You don't need that. You need to put your trust in God and do what you love to do. Nobody's going to help you. To be honest with you, like, I stopped looking for people to help me when I was in a project. Like, nobody's going to help you. You got to get out there. Even if you need to find a little job, stack your money up, save a little bit. I tell people all the time, put 10% in the job, put 90% in you, in your future. Because you have to figure out if you're going to be successful, you're going to have to own some type of product. Product outweighs talent. So you could be the most talented person in the world. At the end of the day, find out something that you love to do and turn it into a brand, turn it into a product, and you will be successful. I mean, and if you put the work in, nobody can stop you. Think about it. It might take you a little longer, but if you believe, you will get there. That's called having vision, knowing that you want something out of life. And you definitely can't get it sitting around smoking and drinking and partying with your friends because you're doing what everybody else do. That's what average people do. You want to be above average and be successful, you got to do what above average people do. Make that circle above average. You shouldn't be the smartest one in the circle if you want to be great. Thank you, man. This, this is wonderful. All right.